The Pocatello Chubbuck School District number 25 will hold trustee elections on May 16th for three positions. There are contests in zone one, two, and five. Zone one is the Chubbuck area and the contestants, uh, candidates are Jackie Craner, the incumbent, and Matthew Romrell. Zone two, which is mostly west of the Portneuf River, the candidates are Janie Gebhardt, the incumbent, and Kurt Howard, and Idaho Lorax, Carta. Zone five, which is mostly east of the interstate, has candidates David Matson, incumbent, and Tony McLaughlin. Three of the trustee candidates were unable to participate in this event. There is no election in zones three and four in the heart of Pocatello. To be sure of your zone, it's best to consult a map and the Bannock County Elections Office and School District 25 have zone maps posted on their websites. Before going to one's regular polling place, it would be wise to find out if there is anyone for whom to vote. And the easiest way to get information is to call the elections office at 236-7333. The elections office is open for early voting, which begins May 1st. Voting is from 9 a.m. to 4.30 p.m., Monday through Friday, and early voting ends on May 12th. Requests for mail-in absentee ballots must be received by the elections office by May 5th. Request forms are available online or at the elections office. Although pre-registration is now closed, Idaho voters have the opportunity to register at the polls. Remember, bring a photo ID or be prepared to sign a personal identification affidavit. The League of Women Voters is a nonpartisan political organization that encourages informed and active participation in government, works to increase understanding of major public issues, and influences public policy through education and advocacy. League helps voters learn about the candidates and issues as well as voting information. The League is a nonpartisan organization neither supporting nor opposing candidates or political parties. Thank you. Why are you running for the school board and what are your qualifications? Well, I'm 66 years old and I've been retired almost eight years now. And uh, um, after work, it was, it's all about the children. That's what I, I want to give back. Mm -hmm. after, after work, um, all those years, I should start, well, no, I'll, I'll continue with that. Uh, I, I was a CASA volunteer. And uh, I had a friend that got me into that and it was the best thing ever. And I dealt with Judge Murray in six years as a guardian ad litem. And uh, that's just, I want to continue doing this. Uh, all pro bono, just, just I want to give back. So uh, that's what I've been doing. Uh, and about four years ago, actually, I, uh, I got to run for the seat and got it, and I enjoy it. I enjoy it. I think I bring a lot of, uh, they don't usually see somebody like me from the business world coming in and without an agenda. Uh, just I want to take care of the kids, and it's easy for me to make a decision that we have to make some tough decisions and basically it all comes down to think about what is good for the kids and then it's simple Then the answers are simple so anyway that's that's basically it qualifications uh, went to ISU uh, graduated from there uh, 50 years ago it seems like 
Uh, originally from San Diego, California, and came up here. This is my home now. And, uh, you know, my wife, been with her 46 years, going on 47, I believe. And, uh, yeah, it's just I want to give back. So qualifications, I've been a dad, I've been a grandpa, am a grandpa, and uh, I want to give back to the community. Well, I've lived in Pocatello all my life. Um, I have four kids in school district number 25, uh, two kids that go to Pocatello High School, uh, one sophomore and one freshman. And then I've got uh, one that's going to be going to, to Hawthorne Junior High and two at Wilcox Elementary. And, uh, you know, I, I feel like my, my qualification is that, um, you know, I'm, I'm a resident here. I've lived here all my life and um, I want to continue to support teachers and, and students and uh, to make sure that, you know, the, the good performance that we've had continues and to continue to search for ways that we can improve. I think the school district has done a very good job of um, looking at, at ways to utilize all opportunities for, for students and to, to work with a lot of different things. And the school district has, has had a lot of challenges put in their way. And I think they've done a very good job and I want to help continue that. Um, I feel like part of my qualification is that I'm a, a good problem solver. Um, I, I tend to look at things a little bit different than, than most people so I can come up with, with new uh, solutions and, and different opportunities. Uh, and overall, I just want to help uh, continue to, to help our school district move forward. Uh, and I think that's, that's about it. I, I just want to want to help out with that. Um, obviously, the, the pay is so enticing <laughs> as, a, as a volunteer position. Um, anyways, I, I guess that, that's about it for that question. Well, I'm running for the school board because I'm trying to save lives here. Most people in this community know that's what the Lorax Group or myself is, is about. We're here to save lives, to get compensation for people for medical, to clean up Pocatello rather than go for the buyout and it become a ghost town and a ghost university. We want to clean up the community. We, I came here with billions of dollars for that and to save the children, save the lives of the people in this community. This is a very you know, unusual community of cancer materials. It's not just Pocatello, but Pocatello is where I am, and that's where my people that I help represent is here. So saving their lives is the most important. My qualifications, yes, I'm a scientist in multiple areas. Am I an educator? Yes, I'm an educator. I'm a specialist in what you call project learning. And of course, this is gonna be one big project to clean up Pocatello. And who else to have but an expert in project learning and how to even bring this into the schools like other places I've given talks to people integrating environmental problems that they have in their own communities how to integrate it into the curriculum and this would all be a win-win situation for people that we, when we do it that way okay the university included becoming leaders instead of people that are covering things up so it's important that the university's on board and I have talked with the university I met with some of the staff of Bayless and so we're here to clean up this community and radical change in the community one that those people who are used to living with uranium will have to decide maybe it isn't such a good idea after all that maybe we should get rid of the materials here, especially since the data is there, it's uploading, it's gonna keep uploading, it's on the school still, it should have been removed when I was here before. Was I here before? Yes, I was. I was the scientist that helped get it illegal and expose what it was, and I'm just back here to help people finish the job. So Mothers Against Death is the people that you'll hear more about to clean up Ocatello and Chubbuck. Well, I'm running for the school board because I love public education. It's a passion of mine. I've, I've volunteered in the district, I've worked in the district, and it's a way for me since I retired to kind of give back uh, to the district. And because I love the kids in our district, I think we have super kids and, and uh, teachers and administrators also. My qualifications are, um, when I was younger, I was a parent volunteer. After that, I uh, worked as a teacher's aide at both um, Chubbuck Elementary and Lincoln Elementary at that time. And then I was the PTA president at Ellis Elementary after that. 
Then I finished my elementary education degree and became a teacher in the district, an elementary teacher. I worked at Bonneville Elementary and Indian Hills Elementary. And uh, as a teacher, I was on reading and math adoption committees. I've served on boundary, high school boundary committees. And uh, I'm now a member of um, retired teachers. And uh, then when my kids were in high school, I was uh, part of the Ramrodders Club and served on an, at an office on the Ramrodders Club. And, and then I've been serving on the board for the past eight years. But I, I just I grew a love and a passion for the kids in this city. And I've loved public education. And I see all the wonderful, great things we do. And, and I just um, wanted to be a part of that, I guess. How can the school board be accessible to the community and best communicate with constituents? You know, I think that's a big challenge. I think that the, the biggest problem, I don't think that the school board has been inaccessible. I think that the biggest problem is apathy on the part of the citizenry here in the community. Um, I think that there's been efforts to, to try to bring people in and, and to get feedback, but that, that can be a big challenge. There's, you know, people are so busy with their day-to-day -day lives that it can be really hard. Um, I think through students in particular, um, we can do that and, and through newspaper and other things, but ultimately people have to make a decision to be engaged. I mean, I think the school board has tried to be accessible and transparent, um, but th that's a big challenge. That really is a big challenge. Well, it's like any board. Boards usually aren't that accessible. That's why sometimes it takes people who have at least the time, you know. It's not a money issue because you're not paid anything to run for the school board. It's commitment and caring. And we need more caring people. And But sometimes, like any board of directors, somebody's got their fingers in it for other reasons. You know, somebody makes a buck somewhere. And that's a shame. When we go have bond elections that cost, what, $80,000 to run and we get spend thirty dollars per vote to get people to do a bond we got to look at how you spend money in a community and believe me I operate very simply with a low bunch of money that's why I'm an expert of some people who want me to come in who have very little money to spend and I'm a, what you call a recycler or one that's problem solver for how do you want to make the program work and it's usually project learning of course I'll always go back to project learning because it's the most efficient way to learn and the most substantial way to learn and a broad base and of course we have a school here it's not part of the school school district so you'll learn more about that well yeah I just recently tend, attended a national school board um, meeting in Denver and that was a big topic that they had was about um, school boards and communities working together I think that we've always tried to form committees when we have questions or concerns come up that we have the community be part of that. Um, we're accessible through the district, uh, through, um, we have Facebook account now that people can p look on and that we try to get information out on that and that people can um, write on, they, can, they email us. And, and uh, we try to have general uh, meetings. They can always come to our work sessions and our uh, regular board meetings. But I think it's something we continually work on. We all become a member of, a, of committees uh, that are based with the community, like key communicators and, um, and some other meetings like that where we work with community. Well, you can see our, our information about how to reach us on the website at the school district, so it's right there. We couldn't put our phone numbers on there, but I answer every email. Uh, I try to get out to a lot of functions and let people know, and I think everybody knows that I am the person or they can talk to somebody. But, uh, and it's, uh, we, that's, that's my job, to represent them, and then I can take it to the appropriate person at the head office and uh, get the questions answered their problems taken care of. That's what I do. And uh, I won't be calling them back. 
but I'll be handling the problem for them. So uh, it's, it's simple and I look forward to it. Though most people don't call. Most people don't, they, 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 they don't bring it to me. Uh, and that's a shame, they should, because I'm an elected official and I, I'm there to do work for them too. So anyway, hopefully that answers it. Does School District 25 have sufficient funds to excel in its mission? And if not, how can the school board ensure sufficient funds are available? Oh, funding is all how you're spending the money. I've worked at places people brought me in as special education projects in maybe alternate schools even, or you know, different, you know, what you call community schools, like our community school here. Um, Project Learning School, again, I guess I'm mentioning that now. Uh, but basically people, I've seen school boards get rid of all the people they don't want, the kids and stuff, because they want to look good, send them to some alternate school. I come into the picture, brought in with experts and myself, and we turn the whole thing around and then they attack the school because our kids succeed and do it very, very quickly. So problem solving how we learn, we burden our kids, we burden them with just the technique sometimes of how we teach. You know, we don't give them that freedom and teachers aren't trained. Well, they surely weren't trained when I was in it, but now there's a bit more of how to integrate groups in project learning and how to, how to adapt it even to curriculum standards. Well, I don't think you ever have enough money for all the programs you would like to see happen and, and for everything that you would like to offer and to do. But I think that's part of the challenge of being on the school board is learning how to best use those resources that were given. And um, we had some pretty lean times the last eight years. And luckily, at least the last two, maybe three years, the legislature is really trying to help give some of that money back. And so I, I think that it's important to be good stewards of that money. and to try and fund those things that are necessary and that will help our students become successful. And while we've had to cut back on some things, uh, now that funding is getting restored, we're trying to look at some things that we can restore. And so that's exciting to do. I think next year I know we're putting back some PE teachers in elementary schools, so I'm excited about some of those things. Well, this, it, our funds come from the state. Most of them come from the states, and so that's that's pretty finite. Uh, I know, as a board, and I know as administrators, th that we are good stewards of the public money. We stretch it as far as we can, and uh, it'd be nice to have more, but uh, that's 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 just an ongoing problem, and and uh, we get where we get by. We can we do as much as we can with what we have. And I don't know if it's ever going to get better. You know, that's a difficult one. I, I don't know that I would say I'm an expert on the, on the school uh, budget as far as the amounts that are available. Um, but I, I do think that it is a challenge. There, there's a wide range of, of needs among students. Um, the socioeconomic situations of students are vastly different. The home lives are vastly different. And those are major factors above and beyond what we can do uh, from a funding standpoint. Um, I think that, you know, we always want to pursue additional funding for teachers. Uh, that's how we retain teachers and how we can get, continue to get good teachers here. And so that, that's essential. We've got to go to the state and always, you know, be, be getting what we can to help support them. And I don't know if we can ever have enough, um, but I, I do think that's a, a major challenge for the district. What is the number one challenge facing the district today? Well, I think it's always, it's always related somewhat with financing. You know, I think that um, years ago we didn't have to have supplemental levies or we weren't so dependent on them. You know, now 14% of our budget is based on the supplemental levies. And that's, that's true for 80% of the districts in the state because I think it's 80% that have to use supplemental levies now to get by. 
and um, these last two years are the first years we've been able to adopt new textbooks. You know, we haven't had the money for the last eight years to really fund new textbook adoptions. And so um, some of those things, balancing everything, we, maintaining our buildings, you know, we're now in a process of trying to, to upgrade our uh, outdoor facilities so that, um, so that we can take the best care and be the best stewards of the properties that we have. Uh, teachers. Uh, teachers are our biggest problem. You could throw, you could say money too, but that's you know, people get tired of talking about that. Teachers, are, because of what happened about ten years ago, and you know, you can get into that. Uh, teaching as a profession became uh, not very exciting for youngsters to go into. Uh, pay, uh, getting blamed for everything in society at all was because the teachers' fault. And right now, finding new teachers. Uh, retaining the ones that still, uh, you know, before retirement, maybe get them work a couple more years, but there is a definite shortage of teachers right now, and our education colleges are not putting out enough candidates. And so that, that is the looming problem that we have. And so that answers it. That's what I think. Wow, one, one challenge. Um, I don't know. I think, I think that's pretty hard to narrow it down to one. Um, but I, I would say the number one, in, in my experience, the number one challenge facing students in general is their home situation. Um, and, and trying to teach students things at school that are not reflected in the home is, is a big challenge. Um, because kids can learn those values, but if they don't see those things at home, um, whether it's uh, being thrifty with their money or studying or you know, making the extra effort to do homework, um, if, if the parents aren't on board with that, um, that makes it a, a really difficult thing. Um, and I think that's where after school programs come into effect, uh, early, you know, the, the breakfast before school, things like that are helpful. Um, but I think that's the number one challenge is engaging parents. Well, the number one th problem challenge, of course, is we got to put health first. And I'm talking the safety of kids even picking up and bl bl bringing deadly materials into their schools from their own school or their neighborhoods. I am behind in the writer of the nuclear free school zone, which has nothing to do with INL. It has just to do with another corporation, FMC Corporation, bringing problems to our community in the past and getting it resolved so these kids aren't playing in it, aren't bringing it in there. That should be the highest priority above anything is their health and well-being for their future. There is no future if they end up with rare cancers or what the stuff does or the mental problems it causes from Lud's disease. I mean, it's heavy metal poisoning. You know, we have that vehicle. The safe time is mostly through the winter. Great year this year for the wet, long winter, but it finally dries out and it gets airborne and that's a problem. So what are we going to do? We got to work the whole thing together, make it into part of the learning experience here. What issues does the district need to address in its academic program and offerings, or what changes could it make? <laughs> Maybe it goes back to money. A lot of things we'd like to get into would uh, require more money. Uh, uh, bringing PE back to the elementary schools, wouldn't that be fun? Having full band and, and orchestras and uh, where they're supposed to be, wouldn't that be great? But it all comes down to money. And, and, and then finding the teachers to, to teach. Yeah, and then, and then you know, trying to stay on the cutting edge right now, we're, we're spending a lot of time uh, developing a, a subject like coding. Coding and robotics, that's, that's the new catch word, I, I believe, and, and we're way ahead in that progress. Wow, changes. You know, I'm not sure what changes that w would be beneficial. Um, they, they're already doing so many things to uh, give, uh, give students opportunities, especially like at the high school level, uh, to do VOTEC programs, to do, um, well, they can move, go from one school to another if there's a, a program that's offered at another, uh, at another high school, um, as well as college credits. Um, helping the students uh, take advantage of that. I, I really think that they've gone above and beyond to try to make 
opportunities available to the students. I'm sure there are, there are small tweaks that can be made that might be able to improve that, but I don't see any gaping holes in, in the program. Um, I think Common Core has some good ideas, but I think some of it is difficult for the teachers, and I'd like to make that easier for the teachers um, because some of the, the principles might be a little um, convoluted at times. But overall, I think the biggest thing is letting our teachers teach because we have great staff. We really have great teachers here. Oh, I guess I'm always going to go back to my expertise area of what works, which is project learning. You know, student-centered materials, student-centered projects. And uh, I always used to tell people, what do you remember about your school experience? And they often would say, our project. Well, anybody who did a pro they did a project, they remember that. They remember maybe remember a teacher, but not necessarily what much they did unless they did a project, because that let the kid go or the child go to do something to explore themselves, and everything they needed to do that project would have been quite extensive and across a lot of uh, ranges of this one. So it's interdisciplinary. Project learning is inter just interdisciplinary. Uh, I teach chemistry from the reverse. I say, let's start with the unknown. <laughs> Not something you do at the end, because all the learning to discover what this is, is just amazing how it occupies the brain for a learning experience. And that's what we need to do more in that kind of curricular things, which I'm well willing to give those kinds of direction in our school district to schools. What issues do we need to, I guess, um, one thing we're looking at right now, I can tell you is, the Idaho High School Athletic Association has just put uh, swimming uh, on as um, an approved uh, competitive sport. So we're looking at that to try to add, we have a great deal of interest in that, and, but there are a lot of logistics that have to take place for that to happen. So we're working on things like that. And academically, I think it's just getting our students ready f to, um, to go to college, you know, to, um, to be successful in the world in, in whatever field, whether it's career technical, we have wonderful career technical programs and uh, we have dual college uh, scholarship money, things available to them that we can just help kids get ready. And, and also I think it's important to have programs to help students who are struggling and not meeting those, and we've been able to put in a lot of those kinds of inter intermediation things to help those kids. What can the district do to ensure that students who graduate are ready for post-secondary education or careers? Wow, that is a really big question. Um, I think that, that overall the curriculum is good. There are a few things that, that might be added. I think one thing that was taken out of schools years ago was civics, and, and people don't have a general understanding of how basic things in our society work. And I think that would be important to institute uh, some civics, um, as well as other, other curriculum that would help kids in practical things like taxes, interest rates, balancing a checkbook, some of those basic things that we run into where we think, you know, I haven't used algebra since I took that class, but being able to do some of these basic financial things would be really helpful. And so I, I think those would be helpful. Um, but overall, like I said, I think that, that the curriculum is, is pretty good to start with. Students, careers, you know, it's, it's the name of the game, who wants them? Uh, there's a lot of people who just want them to go to the next level so somebody can count the dollars, count the bodies. Uh, we're not actually often, we're not meeting the goal of them, we're meeting the goal of some institution. Now, I'm glad ISU is trying to look at, you know, advanced learning so they can get in there. But that's a very expensive road to go to get in there. You had it free. I myself didn't finish high school. I went right to college. Okay? so. Basically, that was the best thing to deal with me. I'd probably been a problem kid in a school. And so we need to address those kinds of issues. Is, you know, you can go a long way with little money. You really can. But you're bought into a system right now. You need to reevaluate and change that down and actually teach some skills, if they don't have them, of how to integrate that more in that type of learning so they can go to universities. Otherwise, I say, go to another country, learn a language, and go for free. <laughs> 
Well, I, I think we do that a lot through our career technical education uh, classes. I can't remember for sure what we have. If it's somewhere between 34 and 69, <laughs> just about that programs that we offer for career technical education support that they can take in the schools. I know they're even looking at um, students in high schools, juniors and seniors that are taking dual college scholarship, uh, dual college enrollment to actually attend classes at ISU this year as part of take as part of those courses instead of just taking them in the high school, actually attending an ISU class. So they kind of get them excited about going to school and and I just think helping helping kids realize that they can do this and they can do hard and they can they can work through these programs and helping them find whatever their passion is. Do you know we're one of the leaders in the state? Do you, do you know that? Our graduation rates are one of the highest in the state and going to continue to grow. Uh, it, it sure helps to have motivated teachers that are happy and you know, having me and the board there uh, watching what the teachers do and supporting them. Uh, that excites children to move forward to the next. And, don't, and then uh, finding the children that need help and giving them more help, figuring it out way beforehand, being proactive on that. You know, if a child doesn't understand, he won't, he, just by passing, he was not gonna help him with that. We have to take care of it right now. And uh, we do, and we do. And I'd be happy to show anybody or talk to anybody about that, showing what we're doing right now in the schools, starting quite early starting quite early in their career. But uh, I don't know if we're gonna hit 60% when the, the governor wants us to hit 60% by 2012, or 2020, I guess it is. But uh, we're on a darn good path toward that. How can the school board help ensure that children are reading proficiently by the end of third grade? Well, there's another one of my expertise areas, linguistics. Okay, I've taught in projects in other countries for them learning American language. My American language is a difficult language. It's, it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's the worst language in the world to learn. And anybody's trying to learn it knows it because they're looking for rules. They're looking for things that had patterns like, hey, excuse me, Dr. Seuss, okay? Uh, his approach in the phonics, it, it, Webster even had rules, but you know, it seems like all rules went out the door, yet other countries have standards. They have academies before words get formally into a language because we need to teach kids, not make it difficult, more difficult to them. So obviously, language has to be readdressed too of how we approach it. We have to actually look at the problems of our language and address that and how to do it. So yes, I, I did a piece called Global Speak and teaching other people how to do language quickly. I brought Dr. Seuss to China. I have that fame. Well, the districts worked, um, there's been a great deal of emphasis on that. And we have uh, uh, intervention programs, um, we have a lot of intervention programs. They have extended days. They have uh, special programs that deal with that. They identify students. Um, and they, they work really well trying to identify those students early and um, offer them any uh, added help that they can give them. And, and they have added a lot of programs to that, and I think it's really been successful in helping students in our uh, elementary schools. With the help of parents, bringing the parents in if they can, communicating with the parents because that's the biggest key. Parents have to be involved, in my opinion. Uh, the, the teachers and the principals, they're on top of it. There's, there's grading, there's testing. They know who's having trouble and they get extra help for those people quite early, quite in, early in their career. And uh, nobody goes forward. They might have just extra help, but parents can really help. You know, communicating with, with the principal and the teacher and what they're trying to accomplish, what their child is having trouble with learning, what concept. and. That's the best answer. C 
com community involvement. Grandpa, grandma, get involved. Again, that's, that's, a, that's a challenging one. Um, for my kids, you know, we, we were very proactive, and so we had them involved with things, and so they were pretty much reading when they started school. And there are other kids that don't have those, those opportunities. I, I think that um, getting kids involved in, in the Head Start program in uh, kindergarten and early learning uh, situations is beneficial and, and helping promote those things. Um, but, but again, it goes back to parents. You know, that's, that's the biggest challenge is trying to get, engage parents. Um, I think that the curriculum that they're using is good. Um, and I'm, I'm sure there, there's probably something that could be done better, but I think our teachers are really on top of those things. Um, they're very responsive to the kids and, and try to be sensitive to their needs. Um, so I, I think it really goes uh, back to support for, uh, from the parents uh, to the teachers to help with, with that learning and to, to make sure that they're, they can be proficient reading at home and those, those types of activities. What specific steps can the school board take to get families and the community involved in education and the schools? That's probably an age-old question that we'd all like to find the answer to, probably. I, um, I think that the, uh, the social media uh, component that has come forward, you know, these last 10 years, probably really more so than anything, has been a great step in, um, in informing parents of things that are going on and things that are happening. You know, and then we do have um, our technology program with the district that um, goes out where we can notify parents right away. I think um, we brought back parent-teacher conferences to kind of help with that in the elementary schools. In the high schools, trying to get more parents involved, we have parent and and the uh, community meetings, I know we do uh, regularly, uh, so that they can be aware and informed of new uh, scholarship money or help or aids or things that they can do to help their students. But how to get them all there is, I don't know <laughs> how, how we do that. Offer refreshments, I guess, I don't know. <laughs> uh, communicate, communicate and, and uh, blunt up. Some of it's belonging to organizations outside and communicating what's going on, but uh, you know, parent-teacher conferences that the parents can talk to the teacher at any time or anybody at time, including me, and uh, because we need help at home, the teachers need help at home. They, yes, they do the darndest job, but they, the parents need to be involved, and that's that's the best answer, and that's what we try to do every day. Again, that, that's, that's a really great question. These are all really good questions. Um, I think that, that getting the kids to engage with the parents with things that they're already doing, I think that um, there, there could probably be things added to that. But I think the things like with the daily uh, journals that they, that they have, the parents initial every day and, and the, the folders that they sign each week to ensure that those are going home, that the parents are being engaged at some level with those, I think that that will help. Um, I think that Overall, um, we, we want to teach our kids to be leaders, you know, because we're all leaders in some respect, whether it's leading our family or leading a crew at work or leading a business or leading a country. Um, we're all leaders at some level. And so I think that's a major thing that I want to uh, help to institute is, is a, a, a leadership mentality among our students and, and help them to lead their parents because that, that could be a real key. In, in getting the parents involved overall in the education process. Well, again, I will bring that down to what they're doing in the school. A lot of parents are afraid. Oh, I, you know, it's all math, and I didn't take much of that, or I didn't take much of this. But a project is a little different thing. You know, a kid, a child may pick a. 
project that's related to their life and their home. Maybe their their mother or father is what they do, or you know somebody. It's more related, and so there's going to be help that the parent can then be included in. And so parents being involved with project learning is really healthy, and it's and it's one way that parents will actually engage. Otherwise, they say, I don't know nothing about English. I don't know nothing about that. I don't know the internet. Well. You can if you start helping in the areas where you can. So if it's broad enough, you get the parents involved. And that's, of course, going to them and bringing them in. I know it's hard for a lot of parents who don't have the time. But they, the kids bring these projects all the way into the home. Say, this is my project. They're excited. And they see it. And hey, if you're a parent, you're going to help them.